<clears throat> well, I hope my voice will hold out today. It feels a little weak, so I may have to contain myself. I'd worked through a couple different ideas this week on, on what I might want to speak on, and I was not happy uh, on any of the things that I had started to work on, and, and then I opened up Facebook, and there was my idea. There was a few guys that were discussing some things, and one of them hollered out, you're a hypocrite. And I began to think about that, and I don't think I'd ever talk really about uh, being a hypocrite. And so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about that. <clears throat> and you will notice that the sermon's actually titled, Am I a Hypocrite? It's not titled, How Can I Know If the Guy Next to Me in the Pew is a Hypocrite? Or How Can I Know If Somebody Else is a Hypocrite? The idea here is, is really for us to begin to try to look within ourselves because it's very easy to see the failures of others while it's oftentimes very hard to look within ourselves and really admit in areas where we may have problems. And so really that's the purpose today as we begin to talk a little bit about this is really the purpose is for self-examination, although at the time we may probably be thinking about somebody else, and I'll touch on that here in a minute. Uh, but the sermon as we work through it today is really one that's going to cause each of us to have to be have to be humble as we look back and we start to contemplate on certain areas of our life. Somebody once said, and I don't know the author to who to attribute this to, but uh, he had said that lessons like this make the truly righteous really doubt themselves while at the same time making the self-righteous even more sure of themselves. And that actually may be true as you begin to talk about a topic such as hypocrisy. <clears throat> Lastly, as I begin to delve into this subject, one of the things we have to have is an understanding that there are many who, when you begin to talk about whatever topic it may be, they have this mindset that they really haven't heard a good sermon unless somebody just gets a beating. And, and sometimes what we need to do, not that that's not sometimes necessary, but sometimes as we begin to dig through topics, what we need to do is quit thinking about how this applies to somebody else and really try to focus on how it applies to us. And so if you're one of those people that really just like somebody else getting a beating, this sermon may not, it may be missed. Uh, I don't think that that's the mindset that we have here, although I do know that is the mindset of some. Now certainly, uh, we don't want to be one of those kind of people who's always thinking about that person, that person, that person. Again, not that that's not necessary at the appropriate time, but today I want to spend a little bit of time really just focusing in on ourselves. Uh, you guys will recall when we go back to Matthew, I'm not going to stay there very much, I'm just going to touch on it and move. When you go back to Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5, where Jesus was talking about righteous judgment, and again, we are to do that. You'll remember he talked about the one who was trying to help his brother with a little speck in his eye while he's got this big old plank in his eye. And I want us to keep that in mind as we begin to talk about this idea of, uh, of whether or not we may have the problem of being a hypocrite or whether or not we have some of those attributes. And certainly as we work through this, we understand we, we need to have an understanding and an ear of the whole counsel of God, not just the parts that make us feel good or not just the parts that, that make us feel better than somebody else or the fact that we're not like other sinners. And again, we'll look at an example uh, regarding that in a minute. And I want to start off by referring to an account with Jesus. Go ahead and if you will turn over to Matthew 23. And you'll recall where Jesus, and he did it quite often, he would, he would rebuke the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. And many of them made it a point as they were going out in public or as they were at worship in trying to show everybody just how spiritual they were. They were constantly going about and they were putting on this front. And yet Jesus, as he begins to call out these Pharisees because of their hypocritical attitude, he begins to make a comparison, and he does such uh, in a way that none of us would want to be guilty. Go down to verse 27 of Matthew 23, and listen to what he says here. <clears throat> Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Now let me pause for a minute. He's talking to them under the law of Judaism, the Jews, but certainly today what he's saying would be applicable to Christians. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. What was his point? 
you're not at all what you appear to be. You've put on this false front. Now, with that being said, there are many today who would claim to be Christians who are not what they appear to be. There would be some who are not Christians who are appearing to be like Christians. <clears throat> we are frequently tempted, and we know this is true within our society. We even touched on it a little bit this morning. We're frequently tempted to try to wear some type of a false image so that other people will like us. We do it in our real lives as far as away from religion. We do it regarding religion. Uh, and so we can look at an example of this. Go over to 1 Samuel 16, 7. We need to have an understanding that God sees our hearts. Again, we may try to put on a false front, but God knows when we do that. And I could have chosen another, a number of examples. You have actually here where Samuel is going to look at, um, look at the sons to become king. And notice here what we find in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Let me pause for a minute. Those are physical attributes about him. He says, don't look at those things. Because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, as we begin to talk about those who oftentimes are hypocrites, let's first off understand that many of the things they're hypocritical about are simply those outward appearances. They may be a hypocrite by saying, don't do this action, but they do that action. They're going to hide those physical things that people see, and that's why they're being hypocritical. We need to look at ourselves and the things that we do in the same way that God would look at us. Listen to Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God knows whether or not I'm acting in a hypocritical way. God knows whether I'm involved in evil things and or good things. And so what we have to do is to go back and to evaluate all of our actions, all of our thoughts, all of our practices, whether it's worship, whatever it may be. And we ask ourselves, are those things considered evil or good? And then from that, we try to transform ourselves from the inside out into the image that we are to, that we are to be. Go, go to 2 Corinthians 5.17. <laughs> this is a passage that most of you are familiar with. And remember, we're talking about looking within ourselves and asking ourselves, am I a hypocrite? Well, you could be if there's certain portions of the scriptures you're not applying, but you are applying to others. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, here's the logical question after you read that passage. How exactly are things becoming new? For, for those of us who've been Christians, we can remember when we became a Christian and how things have slowly changed as our knowledge has grown. grown. Go to Romans 12, 2. Because here we are to become new, and then we find in Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, notice this, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we do that and we carry it out, we are to be assured that we're not being hypocritical. The problem, as we'll notice going forward, is when someone knows what they're doing, but they're going to continue to do what they're doing or do something that is contrary to God's word, but act like they're not involved in that. And I'll break that down here as we look at the definition. So trying to figure out this question, am I a hypocrite or not? That's going to, that's going to require us in a lot of areas to start to ask ourselves questions. And really, that's one of the things we ought to be doing on a, on a daily basis. We ought to be asking ourselves on a daily basis, am I consciously or unconsciously promoting myself or trying to create the impression that I am something that I am not? It, let me break it down this way. It would be the example of somebody going in, let's say, to a place where they work, and they act like they're a, a very good moral person, but as soon as they leave work, because they don't want their boss to know how bad they are. They, they do all these horrible things. I'm just giving you a real-life application. That's exactly what we're talking about when it comes to our faith. In other words, when we're asking ourselves, am I putting on a false front, we're asking the question, am I hypocritical in any of these uh, things regarding my belief, my faith, and so forth? Now, with that being said, we have to be very careful. Let's use the Bible as our standard because when we have eyes calibrated to the world, we can compare ourselves against each other, and we all come out looking real good, don't we? So we don't want to do that. So let me start off giving you the definition of a hypocrite. And I'm going to go over to Luke chapter 20 because we find there in Luke chapter 20 one of the best definitions actually played out in an example. 
When you look up the word hypocrite, it's derived from a Greek word, hupokrenomai. And that word actually referred to an actor on stage who wore a mask and played a part. You guys ever gone to a theater where a person has on a mask or they put makeup on and they're playing a part? That's where that word hypocrite comes from. You look like one thing, but in reality, you are something totally different. Now, go ahead and go over to Luke chapter 20. <clears throat> I am actually going to use, uh, I'm going to use the modern literal version here. Go to Luke 20, go down to verse 19, but I'll give you the King James word as I get to it. Follow along with me. Luke 20, verse 19. And the high priests and the scribes sought to put hands upon him, we're talking about Jesus, in that same hour, and yet they feared the people. All right, so they've got to do something, right? For they knew that he spoke this parable to them, and having observed him, they sent forth agents who themselves pretended to be righteous. Let me pause. In the King James, you'll see yours is worded, they feigned themselves to be just men. But here in the modern literal version, it says they pretended to be righteous. They were hypocriting themselves, if I can make up that word there, to look like something they were not. They were making themselves appear to be just or righteous, but they weren't. Well, why would they do this? In order that they might grab him from his speech, that they might give him to the rule and authority of the governor. So what do we have here? You have people who are coming in, they are intentionally making themselves look righteous or just in order that they can deceive other people. They're making themselves try to appear to be righteous or holy. Now let me pause for a minute. Wouldn't you say that that's really what people do today regarding religion when they are, when they are hypocrites? They'll say one thing and do something else, or they give the appearance they're doing something when in reality they're not. I think that right there is a great example of a hypocrite, although we'll look at a number of other passages. In the Bible, when you look at uh, verses dealing with hypocrisy, <clears throat> it references somebody who's pretending to be something they're not. They're pretending to be godly outwardly. They're pretending to be pious or righteous. But inwardly, what we find is, is they're none of those things that they're acting like they are. Again, another very simple way to break this down. James addresses this mindset of hypocrisy. If you go over to James 1.8, now, he doesn't use the word hypocrisy here, but certainly this verse applies. In James 1.8, it says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That word double-minded there means a two-spirited man. When you talk about somebody being two-spirited, or if you look this word up, literally it's somebody who is indecisive, or it is a person who is intentionally deceptive. Right? They can do it one way this time and another way that time. They may do it this way while you're looking, and they may do it that way while you're not. That's a two-spirited man. Okay? And this would certainly be true for somebody who is a hypocrite. And so, very simply, as we begin to break this down, what is a hypocrite, and how, how would I know if I am one? Well, a hypocrite's simply somebody who pretends to be something that they're not. They're doing it in order that they can give a false front, uh, and it could, it could fit in a number of regards. This word can be used to both Christians and non-Christians. Now, we're going to focus in on the Christian, but a good example, if you want to make it just as simple as can be, it would be a person who, it would be a person, for example, who is a Christian, and they, they live like the world all week long. They sin like the world all week long. They're no different than the world all week long, and yet on Sunday morning, they get up and they put on their finest suit. They come here to worship. And the idea is to give the impression to other people that God throughout the entirety of the week has been on the forefront of their mind and He is all that they've been thinking about and trying to please. But in reality, it could be no farther from the truth. That is a person who is a hypocrite. Now with all that being said, and being that I saw this on Facebook, you guys realize that accusing somebody of being a hypocrite is a, probably one of the harshest accusations you could make against somebody. I don't know, how, how many of you have ever been accused, just don't answer out loud, but think within your mind, have been accused of being a hypocrite? It's not something that really gives you a good feeling. And I bring all that up because as soon as somebody would accuse you of being a hypocrite, and you may actually be, oftentimes people begin to become very defensive. So defensive, in fact, that they feel they need to justify what it is that they're doing. Now let me say this also, that sometimes the label is unfairly given. Sometimes it's fairly given. We don't know which at the time because maybe there's something we missed. And so we need to go back again. We would always want to take a statement like that, and the immediate reaction should not be to even answer it. 
It really should be to look within ourselves and to ask ourselves, do, do I have certain areas where maybe I am putting on a false front or acting in a way which is different than what I promote to others? Now, with all that being said, we do understand that being a hypocrite is more than sinning. I have to bring this up. We all sin. And just because somebody sins doesn't mean that they are a hypocrite necessarily. They may be, uh, but when you begin to look at a hypocrite, a hypocrite is somebody who knows that they are sinning or that they're putting on this false front, and they're not actually going to do anything about it. That's what we're talking about. It's not just a person who would sin or who would even actually sin, repent honestly, and turn from it, and then, let's say, a year down the road make the same mistake. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who intentionally knows better but doesn't change. Now, logically, as we begin to think about men, you could break them down in two classes. You have those who, who desire and teach that they will follow the will of God, and you have those that will not. Let's break that down very simple. Christians and non-Christians. Let's get rid of the non-Christians for a minute and come back just to the Christians. We can now break that down again. Those that are actually doing what God tells them to do and those who are not. And those who are not in that last category are what we're going to talk about right now. The hypocrites who are actually members of the church. Because there are a lot of people who, who may be hypocrites but are not actually Christians. And we want to focus on how does answering the question, am I a hypocrite, apply to us. We're going to actually spend some time looking at some of the verses given by the apostles. Go over to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. And again, I told you, that, remember this, this sermon is how can I know if I'm a hypocrite or am I a hypocrite? It's not how can I know if somebody else is a hypocrite. So let's look at these and let's apply them to ourselves as we look at just a few of the passages given from some of the apostles. Romans 12, 9, it says, Let love be, be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. That word dissimulation there uh, is the word hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. For those of us as Christians, if we have a true love for God and for others, certainly we understand we're not going to be hypocritical, right? If I have a love for a brother or a sister of Christ here in the congregation, I'm not going to be hypocritical uh, in the way that I interact with them. Go down to 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that were their demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Very similar to what we're looking at in the book of Jude. The point being there are some who were Christians or are Christians who will depart, and guess what? They're going to be a bunch of hypocrites. Pretty clear. I'm going to go over to James 3. Look down at verse 17. It says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Certainly Christians want to follow a wisdom that is void of hypocrisy. You guys know, and it's completely logical, that if we as Christians throughout our daily lives interact in a way where people recognize easily that we're hypocrites, that's going to affect our influence on them, right? And we get that logically. And so our wisdom is going to be void of hypocrisy. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to move over to some of the sayings of Jesus. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. We could look at a number of other scriptures, but it is time and time again shown to us through the scriptures that the scriptures continuously condemn hypocritical behavior. Now, <clears throat> Jesus actually talks about hypocrites or hypocritical behavior uh, at least about 20 times. And so as we begin to ask the question, am I a hypocrite? And we begin to dig down in and look, we've already seen a few of the statements made by, by the apostles we actually get a little bit better understanding, specifically looking at the accounts uh, from Jesus' words. And so as we begin to look at those, one of the things we learn real quick is Jesus showed us that a hypocrite pays a whole lot more attention to his reputation than his character. Go on over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 16. 
It says, moreover, when ye fast, let me pause for a minute. I won't, I'm not going to cover this greatly, but I have a lot of people who ask me questions. Uh, should Christians fast? Uh, there are a number of examples that talk about fasting. Uh, and so here you see an example. He says, when ye fast. He says, when ye do this, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. Notice this. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. These guys are really worried about their reputation. And as I read that, what I get when he says they're disfiguring their faces to appear that they're fasting, what I, what I get from that is, is it appears that they're not actually fasting, but they're trying to make themselves look like they're fasting so that people will think they're extremely holy. It would be the equivalent of if I went for two days and I came in here and I was barely moving because I was so tired, even though I literally just had a hamburger before I came in, but I was moving so slowly. And then Brother Larry said, Sean, you, something just doesn't look right today. And I'd say, well, you know, Larry, I've been fasting and in prayer for the last two days and I'm, I'm really just, I'm, I'm just wore out. That's really what you've got going on here. These guys were worried about the outward appearance, giving a false front, making people think they were extremely holy and pious and righteous, but they weren't. And so Jesus is calling them now on their hypocrisy. Go to Matthew 23, 5. I love this passage, actually. 23, 5. You want to get an understanding of who the Pharisees were. It says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Well, Jesus, can you give us some more information about what it is they're doing? They make broad their phylacteries. Now, let me pause for a minute. You may be saying, what in the world is a phylactery? If you go back and look it up, they actually go back and they take Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, literally. That's talking about binding the Word of God. And without going into the whole passage, they had these little boxes, leather boxes, and they would take vellum, leather, and they would write verses on it. They would place it in the box, and they would bind the box on their head. Now, most of them I looked up yesterday were about this big square. That's not very big, but big enough you could get small little pieces of leather or vellum in there with the Scripture. But guess what? You must be really, really holy the bigger the box is that you're wearing on your head. That's what the phylactery was. They make broad their phylacteries. I must be more holy if I have a bigger box on my head with Scripture than the guy next to me with a smaller box. He goes on and he says, and enlarge the borders of their garments. This is a four-sided garment. We actually, you probably recall when we looked at the prayer uh, cloth uh, robe that they wear. Apparently, the bigger that it was, the more holy you were. He goes on and he describes, the, describes them. He says, and they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. They're only worried about their outward appearance. They weren't really worried about actually being righteous. They're worried about what other people would think of them. And certainly anytime we as, as followers of God begin to become more interested in our reputation and doing what is right, we become hypocritical. And we're going to see a number of other examples. Go ahead and go over to Acts chapter 6. Because as we begin to look through these examples, one of the things we understand is, is our reputation should be based on our character. Our character should not be based on our reputation okay and oftentimes throughout the scriptures we see this phrase of good rapport of good rapport describes uh, those who certainly would not be hypocritical I'm gonna go and look at about three verses here with this phrase in Acts chapter 6 just to tell you what's going on I'm gonna read from verse 3 they needed some non hypocritical uh, faithful righteous men to carry out the work of attending to the widows notice this Acts 6, 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among ye seven men of honest rapport, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Part of us as Christians having an honest rapport or a good rapport certainly would be that we are not hypocritical. That's why we would have a good rapport. Go to Acts 10, 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, so he's righteous, and one that feareth God and of good rapport. Let me pause for a minute. He wasn't a hypocrite. And one of good, good rapport among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. We have a number of examples talking about Christians of good rapport. 
That same good rapport is one of the requirements for that uh, who is an elder, 1 Timothy 3, 7. Moreover, he must have a good rapport of them which are without, without the body, without the church, outside the body, lest he fall under approach and a snare of the devil. How many of you guys would want to have an elder uh, who was hypocritical? He didn't have a good rapport because of the things that he did, of which was being a hypocrite. Certainly, that shouldn't be accused of anybody who's a Christian. Let's break this down a little more because as we look at it and we're trying to ask the question, do I have a problem with hypocrisy? And let me say this, I don't suggest that anyone here does. But you may, I don't know. And I'm asking the same question of myself. One of the things we understand is, is a hypocrite practices spiritual acts while their heart doesn't really feel anything regarding God pertaining to the matter. Go to Matthew 23, 23. We'll get a little more information here. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. All right, so the Pharisees, they didn't have a problem carrying out all the easier requirements that God had given to them. However, they, they did have a problem carrying out the harder or the more, more weightier or more burdensome uh, requirements of God. And you may say, how is one more burdensome or hard, hard than the other? Let me give it to, to you this way. So certainly as Christians, we have a number of things we are required to do of God. It's fairly easy for us to come to worship on Sunday morning because most of us don't work right? It's much, much harder for us to come to Bible study on Wednesday after we've had a long day at work. It's much harder for me as a Christian who works within a, a secular environment to not get caught up in the things that they're involved in. It's easy for us to do the easy things, and sometimes we neglect to do the things because they are harder. But Christ didn't say one was more important than the other. What he said was you should have done both. You should have done both the easier and the, the more weightier matters. So ask yourself this a couple of questions as we're moving through this and I hope the answer is no for all of you, but do you guys ever find or think that the worship for you is getting monotonous or burdensome or that you're not really interested in coming and spending time with the people of God? I hope the answer for all of you is no, that doesn't cross my mind. I know that it does cross some people's minds. Some people allow themselves to drift away from the church. If you're beginning to think that the church is not as important in your life as it once was, you may be a hypocrite. If you're pretending to other people to promote an appearance of something you're not, you may be a hypocrite. Very simply put, if, if any of us, in any regard, and for each of us it would vary, guys, for each of us it would vary, but if we're putting on a false front in any area, let me just make something, let me make something else up off the cuff here. If I was dealing with a personal sin, guys, I'm going to try to really hit it home. If I was dealing with a personal sin and I came in here every week and I put the smile on and, guys, I acted like nothing was wrong. And when somebody said, hey, Sean, how's your week going? And I, I didn't at some point finally call them to the side and say, listen, I'm really struggling with, with this or with that. If I continue to put this false front on like there's nothing wrong and I'm giving the appearance that I, I'm the good, faithful Christian I should be when in reality I've got this secret hidden sin or, or problem, guys, I, I'm being a hypocrite. And I may not even realize I'm doing it. And so that's why I'm asking you, look within yourself and ask yourself, are there areas you're doing that? It would vary for each of us, but it's something that we need to, we need to ask ourselves, am I pretending to be something I'm not? Because if I am, I probably am a hypocrite. A hypocrite emphasizes his own virtues while at the same time he emphasizes the faults of others. Go ahead and go over to Luke 18. 10, we're going to look at 10 through 12. And I'm not suggesting that there's not times when this needs to be done. What I'm saying is this is a person that's constantly looking at how great he was or is and then constantly looking at someone else and basically saying, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. And this is why I think we have a good example here in Luke 18.10. You guys are all familiar with this passage, I hope. Two men went up into the temple to pray. This is Luke 18, 10. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Apparently this Pharisee here he, uh, 
he applied all the scriptures to everybody but himself. There's a number of problems here as you begin to look at how he's looking at himself and comparing himself to somebody else. I bring that up, guys, because as we read through the scriptures, when we read a passage, is our first thought to say, how does that passage apply to me? Or is our first thought really, how does that passage apply to somebody else that I'm thinking of? You know, when another Christian falls into sin, uh, do you have that mindset of thinking to yourself, man, I can't believe they did that. I, I would never do such a thing. I would never be like that kind of person, somewhat like this Pharisee is. Let me read the Galatians 6.1. It's a dangerous mindset. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, this is where John started us off this morning, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We need to sit back and look at those areas where we may fall short, even though at the time maybe we're not, so that we can be prepared for them. But two, also reflection, because maybe we have become susceptible to some areas where we've become hypocritical. Certainly as we talk about asking ourselves, am I a hypocrite? We understand a hypocrite lives by a double standard. Go to Matthew 23. We're going to look at verse 2, actually through 4. Matthew 23, 2 through 4 saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now notice what Jesus says here. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Let me pause for a minute. So apparently what they're telling them is correct because Jesus says not only uh, do you need to hear it, you need to observe it, right? Hear it and do it. But then he says this, But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're telling the truth, but they're not living the truth. What we're talking about here is a classic example of somebody who's a hypocrite. Ask yourself this as we're, as we're contemplating ourselves. Do we ever tell ourselves that we have good reasons for doing what it is that we're doing, when in reality, deep down we know that we don't? If we are, we may have a problem with being a hypocrite. Hypocrites believe some people just don't belong in the kingdom. We talked a little bit about this not long ago, and I'm going to go back. And you guys will recall, you guys recall, I think it was last week, where I said there was a gentleman on Facebook who was very angry, and he told another Christian, you're ruining the church by trying to get homosexuals, alcoholics, drug addicts. He went through a whole list and he said, you're bringing these people into the church and you're ruining the church. That's a person that doesn't want these sinners to be part of the kingdom. Guys, we were all sinners and we're now part of the kingdom and we still sin. That mindset is so messed up, I can't even contemplate it. But look at Matthew 23, 13, what Jesus says about these scribes and Pharisees. He says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are, that are entering to go in. Wow, they were doing the exact same thing. They were being, they're being a stumbling block to those who would be in the kingdom. Ask yourself this, this question. Is there anybody here that you wish didn't worship here? <laughs> I, hope, I hope all of you are thinking to yourself, man, I don't think that way about anybody. Are there any people that you wouldn't invite here to worship with us because of the current sins in their life? People who are not Christians I'm talking about. I don't think any of you would, would hold that mindset, but we know it exists. Have you ever looked at another Christian and thought to yourself, man, I won't be seeing that person in heaven? Because they may be thinking the same thing about you. Here's the thought, guys. We both want, to, we want everyone to go to heaven. We want ourselves to go to heaven, and we want even the person that may be a hypocrite to go to heaven. And so what we need to do is break it down a little bit as we begin to look at the church. And certainly there are hypocrites, and we could be one of them. I hope that we love each other enough that if somebody is a hypocrite, I'd tell them, and I hope that if I'm a hypocrite, they would tell me. But I really hope I would dig down deep into God's Word and realize I'm a hypocrite before somebody even had to. You know, oftentimes when you do have people who are hypocrites, and it was actually brought up by Jerry this morning in Bible study, 
Our actions affect other people. And when you do have people who are hypocritical, it affects people into acting and behaving just like them, oftentimes. Go over to Galatians 2. We're going to look at verse 11. <clears throat> Galatians 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And notice this, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So Peter was worried about what other people would think about him. So Peter began to act in a different way so as to make people think differently of him or to change their perception. And what was the effect? It says that the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. That word dissembled, if you look it up in the Strong's, says to act hypocritically in concert with. Basically, it means to play the part of an additional hypocrite in what was going on. And that's what was happening. Peter's hypocrisy actually caused other people to act hypocritically. That could happen in the church. Are you guys ever worried that the things that you do may cause somebody to look at your behavior and to accuse you of being a hypocrite, or that they'll actually see what you are doing that is hypocritical and follow along? Are you worried about that? We should be. But at the same time, nobody wants to be called a hypocrite. As I was working on this, I know, I'm not going to tell you the minister's name, but I know of a minister who, as he was driving to the church building, it was a nice sunny day, the windows were down on the car, and just as he was getting ready to pull into the church building, his kids were acting up, and he is, he's laying it to them. He's yelling at them in the back seat, and the windows are down, and I'm sure they probably had it coming. And as soon as they pulled into the driveway, the windows are all down, people are walking into the building, one of the kids yells out the window, Daddy's a hypocrite! How would anybody feel when you're charged with being a hypocrite? I don't know if he was being one or not. My guess is they had it coming. But that was the charge laid against him. Nobody wants to be accused of being a hypocrite. Is it sometimes true or is it possible that it's true? Yes, it is. Why is it so dangerous? Well, let's begin to look at the hypocrite's reward. We're only going to have a few more minutes here. The hypocrite's reward. Go to Matthew 6, 1 through 7. When you're a hypocrite and you're living in a way that the Pharisees were, uh, the reward's not all that impressive. Matthew 6, 1 through 7, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Right? They've got the opinion of men. Well, other men think they're such great people. He says, But when thou doest alms, this is verse 3, Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, Enter into thy closet. Let me pause for a minute. This is not a literal prayer closet, guys. I know people have prayer closets in their house. This, is, this should actually be rendered an additional chamber. Okay? Enter into this chamber, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. That's all, all the stuff they were doing was based on outwardly appearance. And guys, their reward wasn't much to write home about. The reward wasn't very impressive, but the eternal reward is even worse than that. Go over to Revelation 21.8. The eternal reward for anybody who dies in a position of sin, whether it be fornication, whether it be lying, whether it be stealing, or even whether it be a hypocrite, uh, is not a good is not a good situation because they're facing a coming judgment. Revelation 21.8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Guys, hypocrisy is a sin that none of us want to be accused of. It's one of us that I pray we're never found guilty of. 
And so I do pray that each of us would examine ourselves and look deeply within ourselves and ask ourselves, are there areas where I may be a hypocrite? And remember, the purpose today was, am I a hypocrite? It was not, is the person sitting next to me or the person at, at worship this morning, are they a hypocrite? Now, certainly our goal is for everybody to get to heaven, and we've spent time on just one small thing that would, that would affect the uh, eternal salvation of a Christian, but I want to turn our focus for just a minute on someone who may be watching this or is here who is not a Christian, and you may be wondering, how is it that I become a Christian? Again, it's not complicated. What you need to have happen is somebody to sit down and to teach you the gospel, to teach you the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Uh, and they are to teach you about who he was, why he came, and the establishment of the church. Because you need to have faith and it comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. You need to believe that Jesus was the Messiah or you're going to die in your sins. John 8, 24. And so that's the purpose behind teaching the gospel and who he is and that there is uh, the church where salvation is found. Along with that is the teaching of the consequence of sin. We've all sinned and because of that there's a consequence. Romans 3, 23 and 6, 23. And therefore, just as Christ commanded in Luke 13, 3 and 5, you need to repent. You also need to confess Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then you need to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. That's what Jesus commanded in Mark 16, 16. Peter shows us it's for the remission of sins in Acts 2, 38. And we see that that was the culminating act before people were added to the church. Acts 2, verse 47. If you're here and you've not done that, if no one's told you about believing the gospel and repenting of sins, confessing Christ, and being immersed into the church, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, into Christ, please don't leave without letting somebody sit down and talk with you. If you are here and there's an area you're struggling with, if there's a way we can help you, if we can offer prayers up on your behalf, you can come forward as we stand and sing a song of invitation.